Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special episode of Real History. I'm your host, Jared Frederick, and today we are joined by filmmaker Michael Wickline, who has something very special to share with us. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, Jared, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Love what you've been doing. Oh, thank you very much. That means a lot. Over 20 years ago, you had a very special opportunity to become involved with the Civil War film Gods and Generals. And we recently analyzed that movie here on our channel. And one of my takeaways from it is that people have very visceral reactions <laughs> uh, to that movie uh, in one way or another. Uh, you, though, had a unique opportunity to be behind the scenes and chronicle the film as it was being shot. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what our viewers will be seeing today. Okay. Well, first off, I described us as the gnat on the elephant. The crew was about 400 people. There were days there were 3,000 reenactors. And at most, I had 10 guys on set. And, and that was split between uh, the first unit and the second unit. So usually on any one unit, we might have had four people or so. So we were a very small presence uh, there. What you're going to see today, um, we shot the, during the entire run of, of the making of the movie. We weren't on set every day, but I think we were there at least 20 days. I have to go back and look at my uh, calendar. And, you know, we picked out, you know, I worked with Vic Haichi, who was the publicist of the film. And we chose days that we thought were going to be key shooting days uh, to get coverage. And we wanted to get, you know, everybody, you know, get Jeff Daniels, get, uh, get uh, Lang, get uh, Robert Duvall, you know, in key scenes. And uh, so we, you know, we budgeted out where we were going to be. And occasionally they would call up and ask us to come in for a special thing. Uh, a lot of times on set, there would also be Entertainment Tonight or some of the other Hollywood guys would be there. And we also would, would give them footage, you know, they would, they would request things and we would provide it for them. So the edit you're going to see is, uh, it's over 40 minutes long. It's what we prepared to give to Warner Brothers and Turner to preview what we had. And our hope was they were gonna use it as is, or even do an expanded version on the DVD or, or whatever. The, the purpose what HBO was doing a half hour uh, making of. And Ron said, you know, do more than a half an hour, give them, you know, more to look at. So that's what we did. And uh, uh, that's what they looked at. So HBO made their own version using footage from ours, plus scenes from the movie, which, we did not, we only had a few scenes available when we put this piece together and they used more scenes from the movie and they shot some additional things. Um, sadly, you know, we were hopeful that this would be used on the DVD when it came out and they decided not to do that. Uh, the first time it actually got seen as you're gonna see it today was uh, the Pentagon Film Festival uh, a few years back and they had asked Ron to do a presentation. So uh, he called up Turner and Warner and they said, okay, you can use this. And then I, uh, after that, used it at uh, the Maryland International Film Festival in Hagerstown. So it hasn't been seen a lot. Uh, it's kind of buried on my YouTube channel. So unless you go looking for it, and we haven't really promoted that it's there. So um, I won't say this is a world premiere, but it certainly is. Uh, <laughs> it's going to get to a wider audience via you. Well, we really thank you for giving us permission to air it on our channel, and I, I think it will be very insightful and revealing, and a lot of viewers will appreciate it. Uh, let's segue now to talk about one of your forthcoming projects and how our viewers might be able to assist you in making it a reality. Sure, yeah. We kind of come and go from the Civil War. I mean, a lot of my friends are people, you know, that deal with it all the time, or, you know, you deal with multiple periods, not just the Civil War, but they're, you know, they're historians and that's all they do. And I, I do a lot of other things. But uh, recently, uh, we've, uh, after Charlottesville, um, when I saw that, I, I thought, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in doing something about monuments, Confederate battle flag, you know, and, and how it's, how it's viewed in society, how it's affecting society, because obviously there's an issue there. Uh, and, and it's pretty divisive. And um, I tend to be a peace kind of guy. Uh, so, <laughs> so it just kind of happenstance, uh, we got put together with people called Move the Monument that were involved with the Talbot Boys uh, Monument in Easton, Maryland, which at the time was the last remaining Confederate monument in Maryland. All the rest had been removed and most of them are in storage somewhere. 
Um, in Talbot County, and the monument had already been moved by uh, a month or so by the time we hooked up with these people. And, and, and what they wanted to do was document what had happened. And, you know, we do that, you know, we said, you know, you can hire us to do that. We told them what the budget would be. And we said, they were like, oh, we can't afford that. So I did research on it. I said, okay, I'm interested in doing this and using this as, as, a, as a focus for a, a larger discussion about Confederate monuments. So uh, we actually put together an LLC called Magic Lantern Productions to do just documentaries. And we have some other things in the works uh, and uh, started an Indiegogo campaign to be the first phase of funding for this. So uh, that's where we're at right now. We just did a proposal to um, Sundance uh, for a grant. We're gonna write a grant uh, uh, Ken Burns uh, and the Library of Congress have a grant opening up uh, next month. I've got a professional grant writer now helping me. And so we're applying for that kind of money. But right now we're looking for some funding just to help us uh, do more research, do some interviews. Uh, and that's what the Indiegogo is about. And our viewers will be able to find that link and additional information about your forthcoming documentary in our caption below. Yes. So, and it's called Monumental Struggle. I don't think I mentioned that, but that's the title. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so, so much. We appreciate your input. We appreciate your work. We wish you well on your forthcoming project. Let's go ahead and now take a look Great. at your behind the scenes footage of Gods and Generals. Mike, thanks, thanks so sir. much. Thank you. Easy on the smoke. Don't put too much in. All right, watching. Casey, all set? All set. Here we go. We are rolling. Action. The creation of the feature film Gods and Generals is a truly American story that follows the passion and commitment of a film director, a media mogul, and the son of a Pulitzer Prize winning author. It includes the talents of some very dedicated actors and the labor of the thousands of reenactors, artists, and technicians that share their vision and have worked to bring it to the screen. This epic historic tale began when author Michael Shera's family went on vacation in 1964. We had been to the New York World's Fair and we made Gettysburg a side trip. I was the Civil War buff. I was 12 years old. I had played with the little soldiers and the bayonets and all this stuff. And we went as tourists mainly for my benefit. I mean, my father had no interest in history. He was not an historian. That surprises a lot of people. I'd never written anything historical. I, what happened to my father was a really a stark surprise because he became obsessed. I remember walking the ground with him. Of course, I'm climbing all over cannons, which is what 12 year olds do. Something took over my father at that point. It started an obsession that lasted seven years. It took him seven years to write The Killer Angels. And it was really from walking in the footsteps of those characters. It just in every way it gripped me and it, uh, I connected with it and, and it became a story I wanted to tell about people that I wanted to spend time with. And little did I know it would take 15 years from that moment to see the film realized. Well, Jim Reynolds held high ground. I had a conversation with Jeff Shara. Uh, Michael, I said, died in 1988, so Michael, the father, never got to see uh, this film being made. I said, Jeff, you know, perhaps we're, we're not done with this, um, this saga. Perhaps there's more books to be written, more movies to be made. I get asked a lot, how did you know how to sit down and write a book? I never 
ever had that much arrogance about it. it was, the idea was to create a story that Ron could take and make into a film. What he said was, wouldn't it be wonderful to continue your father's story in both directions, before and after? And I, my first thought was, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful idea. And I thought about it and realized, maybe this is something I should do. And I don't really know why I thought that, but maybe you know the father should be followed by the son. I don't know, but um, I had no fear because I had no expectations. If you spent $50 million in a movie and you cast the lead wrong, kiss that $50 million goodbye. Uh, you must not make a mistake casting a main character. And you really mustn't make a mistake miscasting any character, because any character who's miscast will stand out like a sore thumb. Don't get seduced by marquee, by who's popular, the flavor of the month, who the critics are running after, who's the top of the box office. These things are in your face. You can't help but consider these things because these are the pressures on you. What you must think as a filmmaker is who is the best actor and who's right for the role. As an actor, the you know the role of Chamberlain in Gettysburg was it was just a flat out great role. The more I found out about what a great unsung American hero he was, um, you know, it became an honor to play him, and then to play him in a way that one would hope he would be happy. You just pick up what you can from anywhere. Well, Buster, I guess, it comes as no surprise, my favorite character in Gettysburg and uh, Gods and Generals, uh, and. Primarily, I think, for this reason that Michael Shara invented him, because he's really um, represents the people that actually did the fighting. When every time people talk about the Civil War, they usually discuss generals, General Lee, General Grant, Jeb Stuart. What he did is he introduced this character who I think represents not only the infantry, the guys, the grunts that did the fighting, but also the fact that he's an Irish immigrant. And they, of course, there were Irish fighting on both sides. If I may say it, I think he's really like the conscience of the film. And I said, I have to have my own guy if I'm going to play Robert E. Lee. So he's he's just brilliant. So therefore, I needed him, I, and he he gave me that. The, the necessary look that, that ensured me a certain comfort. The first day that I saw him on the set when he was in his wardrobe and his makeup and hair, I mean, I was like, I was really kind of flabbergasted at how great he looked. I mean, he looks like any photograph you've ever seen of Robert E. Lee. My father was from Northern Virginia, and on my mother's side, we were related to Robert E. Lee. So therefore, I figured maybe I could uh, bring some credibility to the part through bloodlines. He was a gentleman, he was a soldier, he was a cultured man, he was brilliant. I think General Winfred Scott called him the greatest American soldier when he served in the Mexican-American Wars. General Lee, are you all right? <coughs> I just think he was a, a soldier's soldier with, with many uh, social and moral graces to accompany that. But he was held in great, great awe by these people, just like a godlike figure. And I think he was an exemplary person, Robert E. Lee, and they, it, 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 was, it was a great challenge to play him in an honor. Look, when we first uh, were, were considering who to play Jackson, who's the lead in this movie, a lot of star names came up, and we, you know, talked all through it. At the end of the day, we said, who's really the best actor to do it? And we all said, Stephen, there wasn't a dissenting voice amongst the three or four of us that kicked this idea around. And to Ted Turner's credit, because it was his money at risk, he said a remarkable thing. He said, if that's who you want, go for it. And that's not something you hear in Hollywood. I think of Jackson in, in you know, very poetic terms as well as in many other ways. But you know, I've often wondered why is it that a man of Jackson's stature and uh, um, of, of real interest uh, has not been portrayed before. And um, one of the ways that I put it to myself is that he's been protected that his reputation his, and the man himself uh, has been protected by the valley and uh, by the mists of the valley and by the dales and the glens and the secret ways of the valley. They hold him very, very uh, close to their heart. 
in the Shenandoah Valley. And when you speak to people in the Shenandoah Valley, when they speak of Jackson, it's almost as if he was just there and that uh, he and the brigade just left town. I uh, was a very big fan of the film Gettysburg and of the book The Killer Angels many years ago. I lived in the same area that Ron Maxwell lived in. I used to ride my horse up into his backyard and call him out out of his house. Ron Maxwell, come on out here. We talked about the Civil War and about what was going on with the movies and that he, he had talked that he was going to do uh, Gods and Generals eventually. And he called me up one morning and said, I would like you to play Longstreet. And I just whooped. I just jumped around like a kid. And I didn't ask why. I just said, all right, tell me when to show up. <laughs> We had a very fast prep on this movie. It, it literally, I came in here on July, I think the 9th is when I was officially hired, and we started on August the 28th, and it was like being shot out of a cannon. It was very intense in terms of, of evaluating thousands of photographs and letters that were sent to us. They hit the ground running. We don't have weeks. So the decision has to be made Monday whether we're gonna build or not. 130, 140 sets spread out over a fairly large area. At least one way to, to define democracy is as an ongoing discussion as to how free are we. Where do my personal freedoms conflict with the freedom of, of, of the group? These guys are Lincoln Junkin. You guys are Junkin Lincoln. Let's try to get together right now. Start with Lincoln. Now, go! Lincoln Junkin! Lincoln Junkin! Lincoln Junkin! All right, here we go. Picture up. The South, the Deep South, had already seceded between December, January, and February, and uh, Virginia didn't secede until April, and that flag was already in existence, and so the students had, it, had the flag. In fact, they tried to raise it on prior occasions at the University of Virginia, at, 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 at Washington College, and in both cases it was taken down because Virginia hadn't seceded yet. But then after they seceded, the flag went up and it stayed up during the course of the war. It was the best. You got it. Nailed it. Right. Nailed it. And the war came. He chose, he went with his state, as it did many others, Lee and everyone. It had to have been a hard decision because he'd already been a federal soldier for a long time, had sworn his oath to the United States government. I know that was not easy for a lot of them. The best is to block that hole and okay. not have people with white t-shirts back there. Okay. You don't have another wagon, right? right? That's no. it. We wagon, all the wagons are out. Okay, so put people, put a row of people there. Okay. Here's Don. Lynn, right now, I want everybody gone in front of the crane here that doesn't part of the set. Let them all step over there so we can start seeing this shot without a million people in it. The relationship between Jackson and uh, Anna, his wife, uh, is such an interesting relationship because it's, uh, it's deeply, uh, deeply spiritual. There's tremendous romance in there, and it's, that's not a balance we see, that's not an equation. We see all that often, I think, in, in cinema. I think that there's almost a kind of a spiritual eroticism that, that goes on in that relationship, which is very, very true to I, when I read the letters to each God, other. how could you make this day so beautiful? As Anna, I was thinking, he's changed now. I have to say, in tribute to, to Ron, you could read two scenes, three scenes, you could read only the scenes of this woman and know this character and know her presence in Stonewall's life. I mean, it's so rich. Each scene, frankly, when I read them at home before I'm working on it, I weep. They, they, are, they speak to something profoundly universal about love and dedication, devotion, and faith. <sighs> oh, nice smile. Now, nobody say anything to Stonewall. Going to, oh, exactly. Stonewall. Yes, he said, I, for war, when I go off to war, I want something. My daughter and I were in Lexington for the weekend, where she's on the board for the Jackson House. And we happened to learn that you all were doing these movies out here. And we got in. 
by saying that I was the granddaughter of Stonewall Jackson and some nice policemen let us come in and I have never had such an experience in my whole life. She really blessed it. She really blessed what we were doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay a while. You guys stand fast right where you are. God is right. Bring the second battalion up. Every shot in a battle sequence like this, every single shot has its own energy. There's a moment in the in the shot when it is filled with energy and power and momentum or kinetic energy. And, and a frame later, it doesn't have it. Uh, and it's and it's not just a matter of, of the aesthetics of the shot or how it's lit or, 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 the, or how it's composed, but actually the energy of the shot, the actors moving through it or the camera itself moving through it or the emotional power. And that's part of, uh, in, a, in a battle sequence, we have literally thousands and thousands of cuts. Every single shot has to be, you have to find that moment of, of maximum energy. Look, there's Jackson standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here today and we will conquer! And then, of course, no shot lives by itself. It lives with the shot before it and the shot after it. Joe B, that was excellent. Men, that was excellent. Those on the ground and standing, a big bravo to all of you. Even though it's shot very deliberately and it's meant to go together in a certain manner, in fact, that dis that's a, a process that happens in the editing room and um, it never is put together quite the same way you thought when you were filming it. It really does have a life of its own. There are about four or five mini scenes, really, vignettes of Jackson, where the bayonet comes up. And he talks, first he talks about the value of the bayonet, and then he's giving orders, and he, he also says, remember the bayonet, and then later it's fixed bayonets, and then later it's, you give him the bayonet, and then it's <laughs> bayonet attack. And it's this kind of little one-act play, just about the bayonet, which, uh, which only in the, in the acting of do you, did I begin to realize is just this, this kind of boom, 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 bayonet that gets stronger and stronger and finally it, 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 it sort of got this dramatic pan. You give them the bayonet! <laughs> it's pretty exciting. I was uh, still out of breath. <laughs> Is that your first bayonet charge? <laughs> Actually, no. I'm, uh, I was in the Army for eight years. But uh, this is about ten times harder because of the heat. Uh, a little something from the uh, chapel uh, just for you. Is there a bit of Irish mist in my guy? Yeah, I yeah, certainly hope so, boy. A little holy water for you, lads. Uh, for me, because uh, it's so early in the war, um, everyone's uh, feeling out exactly where they stand. Not only was, was uh, Edwin Booth, his brother, uh, probably the most famous uh, actor in the nation at the time, not the matinee idol that Booth had become, had chosen the North already and, and decided that he was uh, going to stand, uh, stand up for them and voted for Lincoln. Would you be kind enough as to autograph my playbill? And who do I have the pleasure of signing this playbill for? Olivia. Olivia. Mm -hmm. And so Booth is, is just trying to find his legs because he's young, he's, he's 20, 23 years old, and he, just trying to figure out exactly where he stands in the world, let alone on the side of a war. Because of that, I, I, I play him boyishly, uh, charming and, and interesting, and trying to answer those questions that during any war you try to answer, uh, where do I stand? Ron is a scholar. You know, he really feels like the old-fashioned definition of a gentleman scholar. He researches everything for years. Uh, he feels a moral duty to be truthful in his storytelling. And he has a great respect for the power of the word. One of the great parts about the Chamberlain side of the story is that he's so humanized. 
you know, he's not just a military strategist and, or a general. I mean, he's a professor, he's a husband, and, and the scenes with Mira Sorvino, who plays my wife, is, 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 is a real opportunity. It establishes this, you know, the love of home, the love of family. I'm an old friend of Ron Maxwell's, the director, and uh, he called me up and said, hey, would you like to do a cameo in my movie? And he faxed me the scenes, and they were really well written, and it, it, it is a very interesting part. She is an artist and a music teacher and a very feisty person who's very much in love with her husband. When you have somebody like Mira Sorvino there, I mean, it's just, it's all there. She's one of these actresses that you can look at her and years of a relationship are established in just one look. She was a very independent person for her time and uh, not afraid to speak out. He gave you a commission, didn't he? They need serving officers. How could I refuse? Damn you, you'll be good at it too. You'll be good at soldiering just like you're good at everything else that you do. So go. Go on and do your duty to your country's flag. Go on and get your medals for bravery. Go and get yourself killed. We can't. Sometimes you can't respond intellectually. And um, it, the fact that, that Chamberlain himself was somebody who I think understood that. Good morning to you, sir. Buster had sort of, in a way, adopted Chamberlain to make sure and he was going to be at his side to see him through because this was a valuable man. And Buster recognized that. When the tragedy happened in, in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania, we were shooting. And, you know, there was a big decision whether we kept shooting or not. And a lot of us were sitting there. And, and I, I remember thinking, I want to keep shooting because look at what we're doing. You know, look at the project we're on. And it's, we're, we're making a movie about a time in our history when we were tested. You know, history repeats itself in a way, you know in principle anyway, and I, it just, I was so glad to be on this movie playing this role. Hey right, guys, when, when the camera goes now, you remember who you're portraying, okay? Remember what you're portraying. You make those fellas that came in force proud, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And these are guys who were just living brutally. Jackson set a tremendous example for the men, and um, I think what happened was uh, they began to believe in their own mythic status. And when men, when people do that, they can achieve more than they ever thought they could achieve. Lee learned learned because Lee was such a, a, a terrific judge of of character of men of their skills of how he could use best use them and he really learned how best to use uh, Jackson. Robert E. Lee was the quarterback and he handed off to the great running back of Stonewall Jackson. The National Park at Harpers Ferry is a real treasure. It's a very unique resource. It's a beautiful place. They have tremendous 19th century uh, buildings there. And it was just the perfect backdrop for what we needed for Fredericksburg. Action. Action. And there's no way that we could have replicated what we actually had in terms of an actual piece of history. The Park Service has never done anything like this at Harpers Ferry. There's been some small films there, there's been videos there, but never has a major motion picture company from Hollywood come in and, and literally consume the lower town of Harpers Ferry, and that's what we did. And so we had to do it uh, very sensitively. We had to do it carefully. We had to do it with uh, constant cooperation. Another reminder, guys, the Confederates, wagons coming up behind you. So if you feel it come behind you, just veer off to the right. If you get up to the top, veer off to the right, onto the sidewalk, so that it can get through and go past cameras. 
We're going back down to Shenandoah and High to do some shoot 'em up. You gotta kind of you'll stealth yourself in between the two barrels. You get in, you bunker down, right? And you're waiting for that ready, you know, fire command. We're breaking another ten here. There's more fear. I mean, there's a huge federal army bearing down on you, and you're just trying to take quick pop shots and then get the hell out of here. As far as the reenactors are concerned, is it, the bottom line is there would be no movies of, of this nature without them, and uh, because they not only come with the their equipment and their passion, but the expertise and everything else that it takes to make this stuff convincing, uh, and uh, it, it would just be it would be out of off anybody's budget to be able to do it with a bunch of uh, extras, you know. Uh, these guys are not extras, they're integral part of this movie. Okay. <laughs> they work a lot harder than we do. I go places when, you know, you get lost in it to the point that, that you truly are, in a way, living it or maybe even reliving it in a strange way. When we were charging up Fredericksburg, the hill, um, well, several of us mentioned, I mean, there was no acting involved there. I mean, we're lucky there are no bullets. You know, the cannons don't really have, you know, anything in them. She wouldn't know it. running up that hill and with explosions of people flying past you and bullets and guns and cannons going and and it was all I mean it was directed as like a train wreck in a good way I mean Ron just said and you go up there and then you fall back and at a certain point people falling all over each other you know crashing and ad-libbing you know trying to get the you know dress the line dress the line same things I mean it was the chaos of war Before the 20th century, before the world was lit by incandescent light, uh, people around the world, and certainly people in North America, were much more aware of the night sky than perhaps we are today living in highly illuminated cities. So um, all of these Civil War soldiers uh, would have been, uh, you know, the starry sky would have been a daily part of their lives. This particular scene uh, was an extraordinary occurrence that happened on the on the night of uh, one of the battles in the Battle of Fredericksburg because there was an, a highly visible aurora, aurora borealis at this latitude, which is indeed a very rare occurrence. There's two areas of music. One, one is the area of music that, that is, goes on that you see, the, the uh, source music. Remember the spirit, the location where we are. It's the same woman, so it cannot be too... Oh, uh, okay. Yes. The same woman, exactly. Marching bands, fifes and drums, guitars, fiddles, singers, um, church hymns, uh, piano music, all that's got to be done to play back. So it's pre recorded and played back on the set so that then people lip sync it or, or, or think or whatever, that they're re replicated, and that enables us to do take after take after take. gentleman I met down recently when we first started filming or right before we started filming down in Stanton a, a retired Navy captain who's doing an in-depth research on Lee's letters and writing things and so forth and I said to him let me ask you something would you say safely that to these people of the south that Robert E. Lee represented the second coming of the Christ he said absolutely tail sticks on A
<laughs> the USO show that we filmed a week or so ago reads about an eighth of a page in the script. And when you read that scene, you know, you go, you know, scene 264, you know, USO show or whatever, uh, uh, Jackson, Long Street, Lee, sit around, entertainers come out and sing. Okay, next page. And of course, we made a meal out of it. Well, then General Jackson. No, I want to keep Diane on this side. I want to keep Lacey with you. Go on the other side, Mr. Lacey, sit, sit with General Jackson. So every time you see a piece of leg, you cover Jackson's eyes. Every time she reveals a bit of foot, okay. just go like that. Do you have to put your next to Kemper? <laughs> Good morning, General Lisa. And in a sense, that scene becomes the high water mark of the Confederacy in this film. This joyous sharing of, uh, of, uh, uh, of each other. <laughs> That's right, do that. General, we owe you Texas boys a debt of gratitude for putting on these shows. Colonel Pat, any man who can't handle a guitar or fiddle ain't fit to carry a musket. All right. That's good, so put your arm around him like that. All right. All right. Okay. If I can just remember it. <laughs> 241 Baker, take two. It's our best moment. There should be a big wide shot of this whole forest today, you know, like square miles. If you can give me a note on that, I appreciate it. Port arms. Orders are tonight, gentlemen. Keep it quiet for the general. No one comes in or out. Shoulder, arms. That evening that Lee and Jackson set up all night uh, planning that, that flanking move was, I mean, it was unbelievable as far as creating a strategy, executing a strategy, and successfully maneuvering the strategy. The only thing I want to add is that this is an opportunity that suddenly presented itself because you're outnumbered three to one. And there's an opportunity, this is a way of like reading the tarot cards mm -hmm. that you could find a way through this and turn the great disadvantage to advantage. But there's, a, but there's, a, there's this incredible urgency because it's, tomorrow there's, it, there's going to be conflict one way or the other. It was nice working with Stephen. He's very possessed and very passionate about playing this part. He was very, very, very deeply dedicated. And the piece, the whole piece, is really more about Stonewall Jackson than it is about Robert E. Lee. It can be a dangerous thing to work with uh, someone who is such a, I think, idol is is the right word because he has been an an idol to me for a lot, for many, many years. He's the actor, my, has been in my estimation, you know. Who's your favorite actor, Lang? Duvall. I mean, I was just working on a toe-to-toe, eye-to-eye -to -eye basis with, uh, with a great, great actor, and I uh, kind of confirmed why I dug the guy in the first place, why I've liked yeah. all his work. Background. Action. It's, it's kind of a paradox. You've got to create the kind of being lost in the battle, which is where the characters are, but not lost in the, in, in, in the story of the film. Because once someone, once the audience is confused, uh, you, you lose the thread of the story, and it's you got a problem. To be someone that was able to be with Jackson and ride with him, I think there was a tremendous amount of discipline that was involved. You could never figure him out. You never knew what he was doing. You never knew what he was thinking. You couldn't predict him. He was like, I mean, he was kind of like an enigma. General, sir, we are beyond our lines. This is no place for you, sir.
cannot go the way I'd hoped. It will have to be tomorrow. Gentlemen, let us return to the road. Ron and I sat and we talked about the needs of the scene. And, and, and first you start with historic facts. And then you try to figure out how to duplicate those on the film. On this show, I've had as many as 26 stuntmen working in certain scenes, and I've had as few as none in others where we worked with the actors. When we did the sequence where General Jackson gets killed, so it's not spoiling the plot since it's a historical fact, uh, Stephen Lang's a phenomenal athlete and he's an actor that brings a lot to the table with him when he's in character. He's very eager and very willing and very competent at doing things. But it's really, the actual stunt's the easy part, it's the preparation, it's the tough part. No, stop firing! You fire at your own man! But it's a scene of high emotion. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendously vibrant and, uh, energy that goes on in that scene. Um, the actual shooting was something that I, um, I wanted to technically execute really in a way I wanted it done and they wanted it done and I wanted it to be captured by, by camera uh, in a way and that involved uh, uh, working with the horse. These horses were flipped out. My horse during one shot another guy bucked up, horse fell over, he fell over, she got scared, started backing up, ended up stepping on one of the stunt guys. I mean it was kind of chaotic. Three squibs on me, which electrical charges that explode. He shot through the shoulder, <clears throat> through the arm, and through the hand. And then at the same time, I've got to dismount, be in character now, looking at this man as my father, almost, if you know, in the sense of uh, our relationship, and catch him falling off this horse after he's been shot three times. And we made it very realistic, and, and only by utilizing Stephen's talents in that sequence could we have. I mean, the man gave 150%. Little Sorrow was magnificent, man. I just gigged her around. <laughs> I went through a little bit of the experience on the set of Gettysburg, representing my father, you know, sort of in spirit, and feeling and having people say to me, look around you, everyone that's here is here because of something that your father thought of and put on paper. Now they're here for the same reason because of something I did. I have a very hard time just taking that in stride. That's overwhelming. I mean, I look around at what's going on here and all the trucks and the people and the hundreds of reenactors and the hundreds of crew. And I mean, I can't just say, well, I did this. I mean, I will never do that. It's, I'm just a small part of this. This is, is, has grown beyond anything I ever could have expected. I'm overwhelmed by this. Perhaps there will be something to take, uh, uh, have a difference of, of opinion when this movie comes out, but I feel that the motion picture, Gods and Generals, is a more, more mature, more sophisticated, more complete piece of work than Gettysburg is. And it's not to say I'm not fond and proud of Gettysburg, I am. But I think um, if we keep striving and keep working hard and keep pushing ourselves, uh, the possibilities are we're going to do better work as we go on. All right, well, we're done. Okay, way to go, gang. We did it. Someone asked me if, uh, if all I'm ever going to do is war stories. And it's, that's really not the point. The point is that in our history, it's the war stories. It's the, those terrible periods in our history where the characters have emerged, where people have risen to the occasion. That's what, in, what draws me to the story. That's what interests me. That's what I want to write about. That's where the characters are. When you look at a crisis time, we're in a crisis time right now in this country after September 11. Uh, who will rise to the occasion? You know, who, will it, who will it be that we remember 100 years from now from this event? That's what intrigues me. Whether it's 20th century, 19th century, 18th century, we have that in our character. We have those people who rise to the occasion. That's the story I want to tell. Always that's the story I want to tell. Magic carpet, and it's just basically having a rug jerked out from underneath you. Three, two, one, go! 
could do that. <laughs> this man could do this. I could do I that. Do I did that falling on a bed this morning. <laughs> I couldn't do it as well as that guy. That's why we're letting well, that so guy I do it. I, I didn't say I could do it. Better. Why don't you get in there and do it? I should show him how it's done, shouldn't I? <laughs> this, is, this is John Castle's last day on the shoot, so I can't think of any reason why he's not doing this stunt himself. I don't understand it either. We don't have anything after this. John, don't uh, you want to do it? I mean, it looks like fun. No, no. <laughs> it looks uh, just like, you know, when you're a kid, I'd you much rather, I'd much rather Tad did it for me. He's one of the best. <laughs> He's going to make me look all right. Three, two, one. <laughs> Thank you.